uh, we have been talking a little bit about the environment setup. So we explained that we have lifecycle services being connected to our Azure DevOps, and we have a, a dynamics finance and operations environment, which we're going to use for the task recording and saving our BPM, uh, saving our recordings to the BPM. BPM will then generate test cases, test cases in our Azure DevOps uh, project. And as last step, we're going to, uh, we have been setting up an, the regression suite automation tool software on our test client. Uh, important to know for that uh, the supported environments that we do have for uh, Dynamics 365 finance and operations. So we can uh, use the tier one development and demo environments, uh, and we can use them as well in cloud ho hosted or the ones which are on the Microsoft managed subscription. Of course, when we do the recordings and also if we want to playback, we can connect to the tier two, the standard acceptance test or the higher machines, the performance add-ons. But there are some limitations on that. So it will only work for the tier two plus environments which have been deployed with uh, classic uh, uh, VMs. We do know that for the new uh, deployments that we are using service fabric, and we're working on that for making sure that we will be able for uh, doing a playback on those machines as well. But at uh, this moment, you can only do the recording, but you're not able, we're not able for doing the playbacks. And uh, similar uh, for uh, the on-premises, this is uh, both on our roadmap. Regarding supported environments for our test client, there we can use basically any uh, Windows 10 PC might be your laptop, might also be a, a virtual machine. And probably uh, if you think about the regular execute, execution of your test suites, probably you should not take a personal laptop, but you should uh, search for a dedicated VM. That can be then a Windows 10, but she can also be a Windows server. For test purposes, you could also uh, install the regression suite automation tool on your tier one uh, environment and then connecting to the same environment. That's possible if you do have admin rights on the tier one. So this would be only limited then for uh, the cloud hosted uh, environments. For more details, I'm uh, going to refer to uh, the session we have been doing earlier. And uh, there's a lot of more details in that uh, session. For today, I'm going to focus much more on uh, the life cycle of uh, uh, the testing. And uh, basically I've uh, set it up in four steps. I think the first step is you need to define your test scenario. Once you have a defined test scenario, uh, it might be broken in different test cases. Uh, we're gonna need to record them. And that's uh, my second step. And then once we have done the recordings, then typically we would uh, prepare uh, a test scenario that includes all those recordings. And of course, the last step in the life cycle is that we would be playing on a regular uh, uh, timings. We would execute the test scenarios against our uh, environments. So let's look a little bit into the first one. Step one, define a test scenario. So basically what we need to do is we need to have somewhere a test where we can uh, predict what will be the outcome and we must be able to repetitive uh, playing it back and making sure that every time we can be verifying that the scenario is still uh, running as expected. Typically, the person who is uh, doing that uh, should be a solution architect. Uh, sometimes in the larger implementations, there will be a dedicated task manager, but it is somebody who needs to have an overview. And typically those test scenarios might spawn different uh, areas. So it's somebody who has a little bit a holistic view about uh, the solution. And typically those test scenarios, you start defining them during your analysis and your design phase. So it should actually be an integral part of uh, your implementation. Why do we uh, have to do that? Well, first of all, we could just do any recording, but if we cannot predict what is uh, the outcome and if we cannot automate uh, the outcome, 
and the, ver the automate the verification of uh, the outcome, then of course it would be uh, very difficult afterwards, after we have been running our uh, test scenario, to verify if uh, something is now correct or not, because it's not because it didn't throw any error that uh, the outcome of uh, the calculations and so are still valid. So typically, uh, uh, <clears throat> A test scenario is a little bit more complex than just doing a simple task recording. You, we need to think upfront a little bit of what are we trying to do, what will be the outcome, and how can I make sure that I validate the outcome as well as part of uh, my test scenario. For this demo, I have created a very simple uh, test scenario. So imagine that uh, we have uh, <clears throat> A scenario where we're going to create a production order. Then the production order has been created. Typically, the production planner would estimate. Uh, then the production order would be scheduled and uh, would be released. That's typically all activities that are done by uh, the production planner. And then typically what would happen is once a production order is released, the machine, the manufacturing department would be picking that up and a machine operator would start the production order. In a typically scenario, he would do a lot of uh, uh, registrations on a production order, uh, what kind of uh, <coughs> material has been consumed, uh, how long operations has been running. I've stripped it all out, so in, for uh, this demo, I'm just going to start the production order and I'm going to report as finished immediately after. But basically what I wanted to uh, highlight here is that that simple scenario is already spawning two different roles. So I have the production planner and I have the machine operator. And uh, for making sure that I can afterwards will be able to run uh, my different uh, uh, recordings with the correct uh, security role, I'm going to split the records per role. So I will have a task recording for the production planner that I can play back and I'm going to make a task recorder for the machine operator that I can play back. So typically, uh, as uh, best practice, I would split my recordings each time we're uh, uh, crossing a different role. Or also, if there are some uh, <clears throat> things that we have to wait for, for instance, a specific job can only be uh, run after a batch job has been executed, then typically we need to split and we need to make sure that we put a wait time between the two task recordings so that the batch jobs have the time for kicking in and executing whatever uh, needs to be done. Also here important because now I have been splitting my task recordings uh, uh, of my scenario in two task recordings, I will need to have a possibility for passing information from my first recording to my second recording. In this simple example, each time I'm creating a new production order, my number sequence will generate a new number, and that new number, I need to pass it to the second uh, uh, recording so that my machine operator can do a filter on that uh, newly created production order, and that, of course, he starts the right order, and also that he then report, uh, do the report as finished on the right order. As mentioned before, um, I can be. This would typically be what you would be doing a task recording if you would uh, build it for a guide, uh, as a uh, as a task guide uh, for in, as information. But one to make it a, a good <clears throat> test scenario, I need to add some validations. And in this simple example, I'm just going to add two validations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, request uh, the on-hand quantity for my AMP item before I start my production. Then I'm going to launch my production order for this specific item that was uh, that I checked my on-hand quantity. And I know if I now go through all the steps, if I do the report as finished, my uh, on-hand quantity for this specific part should actually be augmented with the quantity good that I have been uh, giving in the report as finished. And that's what I'm going to validate. I'm just going to validate that my on-hand quantity has increased with the uh, report as good on the uh, production order. And basically, if this last test is failing, then typically I know something went wrong in here. And I also know that this scenario is not valid any longer. 
Okay, so now we have been defining a, a kind of uh, structure. Of course, I need to make sure that I have uh, a place now where I can put all this information as test manager. So I'm going to do that by uh, looking into my uh, <coughs> BPM library. So yesterday we created on our uh, uh, LCS project a uh, BPM library that we called uh, RSAT Tech Talk. And as you can see, I have actually just been creating all those processes. So I first split it up my uh, <coughs> BPM here according to the different uh, uh, roles that are involved. So for the product planning, I have been creating a task which I uh, called uh, create production order. For the manufacturing, uh, they get uh, one simple task here to, uh, that's uh, finish the production order. I do re uh, realize that in a real scenario, we would have been splitting in starting the production order, then doing all kinds of uh, um, uh, adding information to the production order, such as the materials used, the, uh, um, the jobs that have been executed and so on. And then at the end, we would be uh, finishing the production order. Just for simplicity and for the demo, I have all added that together and made it into one uh, Finish order. The last step that I added uh, is uh, the warehousing. So uh, we will do some uh, uh, checks on the on hand. So I defined two uh, processes for that. So one is uh, get on hand quantity, and uh, one is uh, validate on hand. And the idea actually is that the test manager would have been set up uh, such a structure uh, according to uh, uh, the way this uh, customer has been defining his processes and uh, definitely make it sure that for the people who are going to do the recordings afterwards, that they can easily find their way. It's quite simple. If we need to add processes, I can pro add processes here as a sibling. And I could, for instance, define a process uh, for my sales department. Let's just call it P04. Uh, And if I say four, then we should type four as well. And then I could make some uh, so the define the processes which are the need fit just by adding a child and just call this, for instance, T0401. And we will need uh, a process for create a customer for an, uh, definitely. And probably we will have uh, they're also needing a task recording for creating a sales order. And as you can see, it is quite uh, easy for creating a structure which is uh, representing all kinds of tasks that needs to be uh, recorded. The way how we are setting this up can be uh, similar to the one that you have been defining when you were creating your uh, um, help system and uh, your task guides uh, for the online help. Uh, if you say no, there is uh, too much difference uh, between what I'm doing for the task guides and what I'm going to use for regression suite automation tool, you could decide, as I have been doing here, just to create a dedicated uh, BPM for my regression suite uh, test test. But the whole idea is just make sure you have a structure that the people who are doing the recording can easily find their way in and know exactly what they're going to do. One of the important steps that I have been doing during the setup is I made sure that I have uh, the VSTS synchronization. So what will happen every time I'm creating a new task is we will be seeing that there are work items created. And basically what I can do now for each of those uh, work items, I am expecting somebody to do a recording. So basically I could use, this is a link into my Azure DevOps, and I could really use the possibilities of Azure Dev DevOps and making sure that I can, for instance, assign this task that needs to be done uh, to the user who will be doing the recording. And of course, I would give them some information of what I'm expecting from a test case. So important is to make sure that he knows what kind of input parameters he gets for starting 
and also uh, explaining what kind of output parameters you uh, expect to be in the re recording. If you remember, uh, I'm going to pass the item ID from my on-hand check to my production order. So input parameter for my create production order will be the item ID. And the output parameter is I need to pass the newly created production order to the second recording. So that would be then my uh, output parameter for the cre create production order thing. That's the first step. First step is we have been now defining the scenario. We have been defining all uh, the recordings that needs to be done. So let's now go into step two and look a little bit to uh, uh, the next phase is the recording of the test cases. So we're going to do that uh, just by starting up the task recorder in uh, Dynamics 364 Finance and Operations. As uh, indicated earlier, we can uh, define uh, whatever uh, uh, environment. So it doesn't need to be the same environment as the one that we're going to use for doing the playback. But it's important is, of course, it needs to have the same version and it needs to have the same parameter setup and it should have uh, at least uh, uh, the data that we're using must be available in both uh, environments. Typically, who will be doing the recording? That's uh, functional architects, key users. And uh, typically, that uh, should start happening when we are doing uh, our user acceptance testing. So as I mentioned, it is necessarily that we do have a setup. So we need to have already a setup. Typically, we also need to have some migrated data. So all those things should be ready once we're starting user acceptance tests. And uh, uh, why we are doing that? We need, of course, all those building blocks for then assembling our test scenario. Just going to go quickly into uh, <clears throat> the dynamics, uh, the task recorder and highlight. I'm not going to do all the recordings, but I'm just going to do some uh, highlights. So uh, as I'm saying, uh, one of the most important ones is we need to make sure that we uh, utilize our uh, recordings, uh, our input parameters, and we need to utilize, make sure that we have the output parameters. So let's look now for uh, the first uh, recording. I'm going to take the create production order as uh, example. Task recorder, I'm just going to st start the task recorder, create the recording, and I'm going to name, name it accordingly to what my test manager has been defining. So I am responsible for creating the first one, T0101, create production order. I'm going to start that. So the first step uh, would be that in create production order is that I would have to go into um, the production uh, production control all production orders. And I would click on the new production order. And of course, here I'm going to type in the item number that I'm supposed to use. Um, at this moment, the one that I have been setting up is this one. And I'm just typing it in. Okay, the next parameter is the one for the site. The warehouse I need to specify, let's take 11. So this is typically all kind of information that my functional guys would know what kind of information is necessarily to type in here for making sure that we have a good recording. I'm doing here the bare minimum, just uh, specifying uh, the, the, <clears throat> the mandatory fields, but you need, of course, to realize that uh, typically a functional guide that, uh, or uh, the key user will know exactly what kind of details have to be uh, filled in here for making sure that we get uh, a real life example. Important now is that I should not forget to make sure that I have my output uh, parameters. And as output parameters, I wanted to have uh, uh, this production order number, which is generated. And therefore, I'm going to use a feature from the task recorder. So I have here, if I right click on the field, task recorder copy. And basically, this will make sure that I get a variable name in my uh, uh, task recording later on in my test case 
which will always have the value of the newly created production order number. And I wanted to make sure that I knew the quantity because I want to use that later in my validation. Uh, I could, of course, uh, always test with a fixed number, but I've, if I want to make a parameter out of that as well, I just would do task recorder copy as well. And now I have the two output parameters that I want to have. It is important to make sure that we create that, that we have this number recorded on the screen. As soon as I press on the create button, this number uh, will not, never be available any longer and I would not be knowing it. So the place where we are copying the val uh, this, uh, uh, values is really important to have that as soon as they become available. I'm going to continue my test. So typically, uh, I think I would, in a real life scenario, we would split the recordings in a create uh, production order, and then it would be different tasks for uh, uh, doing the scheduling and for doing the estimations and so on. But I'm just going to uh, uh, continue in the same recording. But important now is I cannot assume that my uh, newly created production order is the last one. I really need to filter on it because if I'm thinking about a uh, multi-user scenario and then uh, in parallel, other people could be creating uh, production orders as well. The one which is highlighted is the last created one and is not necessarily the one that I'm creating. So for making sure that I have a very robust recording, I now have to do a in a first step doing the filtering Four six six, if I'm remember correctly, no four four six, right? If I make a mistake, that's not too bad. I can just uh, delete this step and just going to delete it. And my first attempt is wrong, and I can still continue. So my next thing that I'm going to do now that I'm sure that there is only one order left over, I can now easily do the next of my recordings. As I said, that would be the estimate. And the last step would be the release. Okay, and we're done. So I can stop my task recording, and I can just save it to my lifecycle services. This will connect me, uh, my <coughs> dynamics, into my uh, BPM libraries, and there I will be selecting uh, the right position in my BPM for safeguarding my task recording. My library is uh, the regression suite TT one, and there we will be seeing the same structure. The one for production planning is here. I would then just overwrite my create production order. In some cases, this will not work, and that's primarily due to the fact that we can only support users who are in the same tenant. So if you're working with a partner account which is in a different tenant, then that would not work. As an alternative, we can just save it uh, locally to the PC. That will uh, generate uh, an, <coughs> an AXDR file. I'm going to put it here, and we could just save it. And then later on, we will be able to upload it to the uh, BPM by just going back here to the production order. Create order, and I can use the upload button, which will upload it. And you could just see that says from uh, the preparation, you could just upload it from here. That is uh, <coughs> if the save directly from Dynamics is for some case, in some cases is not working. OK, so the next step that I need to do is my second recording. So my second recording, of course, I need to make sure important one is that my second recording is always starting from a fixed uh, point. So I must make sure that I'm always going to my be begin screen because in the replay, I don't want, I cannot assume that my system is in a specific state. So I need always to start from a well-known uh, system state, and that's the one uh, that you have the moment you, uh, just after login. So I'm going to start my second recording, task recording, um, create recording. That would be then my T0201, uh, finish production order. 
And this recording, of course, will start with as input parameter the uh, <clears throat> the number sequence the number sequence that was used during the first recording. So in this recording, I first have to go to the all production orders, and I need to start with a filter to make sure that I get my right production order four four six. Okay, now I see that this is uh, the production order. I could verify my status, of course, should be released. And I'm just going uh, to uh, um, start the production order. Quantity uh, is the one that I have been creating, is the one. And next step in this would be typically here we would have some time where we're waiting for making sure that there is uh, some uh, re time reporting on the production order. But for the demo, let's just uh, uh, report as finished. Going to take the default parameter, the ones that were started, and we're done with that. Would we'll stop it, save it, and upload it. So this is basically uh, the important things of uh, the features of making sure that we can copy information from one recording to the uh, uh, to another recording. So it's the chaining of tests uh, or passing parameters between the different test cases. Another important uh, feature that I want to highlight for the task recording is uh, if we are going to validate uh, the <clears throat> the trick that we're going to do for that is just going to make the T. T0302, it was called validate on hand quantity. Let's start this one. I made already my first mistake. I'm starting from not from the right position, so really need to stop this one, will never work. Go back to the main menu and make sure before starting my recording that I'm on my start screen, create recording, do it again, and correct this one, T0302, validate on hand quantity, start, and in this I'm just going to go to my uh, product information management, release products, filter on my field. Make sure that I have only one uh, uh, record left over so that I'm absolutely sure in the replay that it will take the correct one. Don't assume that it will be the first one. In a uh, multi-user scenario, you are not sure that it will not be another one. It might be one which is starting with something uh, which is ahead of you. So always make sure that you have something which is unique. And then I'm going to check my on-hand inventory. And I want to know what is my physical inventory. And therefore, here I want to validate it. So I'm going to do task recording validate current value. And note that I have now validate the value for physically inventory is, and it shows me the value. But of course, once we are rerunning the test scenario, it will always have uh, the value, which is in this physically inventory field. Okay, that's it about the second step about recording the test cases. So let's move now to uh, the next step. So typically my uh, um, <coughs> functional uh, the uh, functional people or uh, the key users would now be reporting uh, in uh, the work item in Azure DevOps that this task has been finished and they would reassign it to the test manager so that he can do the test, uh, the, 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 the third step, which is the prepare uh, test scenario. All right, so <clears throat> typically what we're going to do now is we have all the recordings. So we're going to group those together in our Azure DevOps and we're going to bring them together in one test suite. 
Again, who is doing that would be the same person who has been defining the test scenario, the solution architect, the test manager. Um, and of course, we can only do that once we have all the recordings uh, have been captured by our key uh, persons. Uh, and when they have finished, they uh, will re uh, inform us about it. And that's the moment we can st start it. So then and what we, the outcome should be of this uh, step is that we validate that our scenario is consistent. As I was indicating, the two primarily, uh, uh, <clears throat> two primarily things we're trying to achieve is making sure that it is, uh, uh, can be played repetitively and that we can predict the outcome upfront. Okay, so how are we going to do that? We're going to go into our Azure DevOps. And I'm going to go to uh, my test plan that I have been creating uh, in the session from yesterday. So I created a test plan and I uh, created a, a test suite. So we can have for every uh, combination of test cases, so all the test cases together are forming a test scenario. What I would recommend here is that for each of those uh, uh, things that you want to run together, you would, gener uh, you would create an, a new static suite. So you could just add uh, one for test scenario one, and then another one for test scenario two. I'm going to use my demo for the moment, and I'm just going to add my recordings, and I'm going to use the add existing. Add existing, basically, I have been adding already in the query, and I know that all my test scenarios will have in the title, they will have the name of uh, the BPM library, which was called uh, RSAT TT from Tech Talk. So if I just running and I'm just running that query, I will only see uh, my test cases, which are belonging to my uh, test suite. And typically what I would do is I would uh, add all those uh, to my test case, to my test uh, suite. And then of course I need to execute them into the right order. So the first thing that I would do, if you remember the scenario is uh, uh, <clears throat> doing an inquiry on the on hand quantity. Afterwards, I'm going to create uh, the production order. So I need to order this one and I need to put it as in second place. Then the uh, next step is I'm going to finish the production order. And the last one is I'm going to validate the on hand quantity. So this is what we're uh, calling the preparation of uh, your uh, uh, <clears throat> test, uh, uh, test cases into the test suite. Of course, this only has to be done once. So once it's ready, afterwards, I'm just going to uh, uh, run it every time uh, all the scenarios, all the test cases, one after the other. All right, this is preparation. The last step is that we're going to uh, uh, validate it. And for the validation, I'm going to use the regression suite automation tool. Regression Suite Automation Tool, the first step that I'm going to do is I'm going to load my uh, test cases and I will be seeing I've somewhere forgot to save something. Load again. Demo test plan. Um, demo has four. Yeah, that's correct. So if I'm loading. Demo, I need to click on demo, of course, and not on test scenario one. Apologies uh, for this uh, mistake. So as you can see now, I have exactly the same uh, uh, situation. So I have the four test cases, get on hand quantity, validate on hand quantity, create production order, 
finish uh, my order. This is not correct my order. I still need the validate should be on the last one. Create and finish, okay. And don't forget to press the done. That's what I forgot the previous time. And that's the reason why it was not saved. Okay, let's go back into load again. Going to load it and I should have now get on hand, create production order, finish production order, validate exactly as I'm expecting uh, to have. Next step that I need to do is uh, after uh, I have uh, my uh, um, test cases, I need to create artifacts for them. So I'm just going to click here for all of them and I'm going to create new, generate test execution and parameter files. Basically what I'm doing is I'm getting an XML file from the recording. On the test machine, we're going to uh, uh, make a C-sharp file out of that. And from the C-sharp file, we're going to compile it and we're going to uh, uh, <clears throat> having a DLL file that we can execute then after them. What I have been doing uh, when I was reading the uh, recording, the recording does have uh, the data and also have the steps. And it has been splitting that in one step. I have my uh, C-sharp file. And on the other hand, I have my X, uh, XLS file, which is called the parameter file. Parameter file, I can now just verify and I can make the necessary modifications. So remember that I said that I want to uh, uh, have the input, the output parameters from the first recording as input parameter from uh, the, the, <clears throat> the second recording. That's what I'm going to do here in my Excel files. So let's look to the first uh, um, Excel file. What we're going to see in the parameter file, if I'm pressing on the edit, it will spin off uh, my Excel file. And the general tab will give me some information. So I will see the test case, the recording name, um, the playback order we should in your. We also see that we were going to playback it in the uh, company USMF. So this is uh, the same company that was set up as my default. But if I want to run uh, this test scenario in an other company, I can just change it over here and type in DEMF, and then it would be running into the company uh, DEMF instead. Of course, if we are doing that, we have to be very careful with it because we need to make sure that all the setup of those companies is similar because we really want to make sure that all the forms will be popping up exactly the same and will contain the same information. As soon as we're uh, making modifications to that, it might be already uh, making a big impact. For instance, if I start a production order uh, with an item and that item is FIFO, it will always uh, be, I, I will always be able to start the production order. But if I choose an item which is a standard cost, then I can only start the production order if uh, I have defined a standard cost. So if I launch a production order which doesn't have a standard uh, cost, then typically a new form will pop up to tell me that it's impossible for launching that production order. And that's the reason why, uh, although it is very easy for trying to run a test scenario, which is running in one company into another company, we still have to verify that our parameter setup is making sure that we will get the same forms and same controls that we can uh, utilize. If I don't want to run it at this, uh, initially everything will be running as an uh, administrator, but if I now want to run it, run it with a user with a specific role, I can just type in the alias of that person. So I could, for instance, just type in my alias and then it would not be running as administrator, but it would be running with uh, this user ID, with the roles of this user ID. I mentioned that we sometimes need to wait uh, a, uh, a time before something has happened for the batch jobs, for instance. So this is the place where we can put seconds, the number of seconds. So if I want to wait for uh, five minutes, I need to put in a pause for three, 300 uh, seconds here. So that, the, and that will make sure that if I'm running the suite before starting this scenario, we will be waiting uh, five minutes before we start running this. 
I can also specify uh, how long this test uh, should take. If it takes more than that amount of seconds, the test will be aborted. But the most important one is uh, uh, that we have now here the definition of my variables. So I, I wanted to have uh, a variable for the item name. This is my invent on hand item uh, name alias uh, variable. And I needed to have a variable for uh, the on hand quantity. So this is the variable will be called uh, physical invent. So typically the name uh, will be unique. So when it's composed of the form, then the control name, and the task, uh, uh, the test case uh, ID, and it ends with copy. This is how we are recognizing the output uh, parameters, and they will be unique per test case because we have the test ID in it. So if I want to use uh, a, a different uh, uh, item ID from the invent table, I can be doing that if it is in a different uh, test case because it will generate two different uh, parameters then. If I'm going to look into my uh, uh, other uh, field, so I have message validation. Message validation is something that I can be using. So if I have a scenario and I want to verify that specific info or warning messages has been popped up, I can just take a copy of that info message and put it in here. And then we will, uh, when we are replaying the test, we will verify that that message has been uh, popped up in the info log when we were doing the replay, replay of uh, the test uh, scenario. And the last one is uh, when I was doing the filtering, I filtered on an item number uh, from the recording. As you can see, this is still an old one uh, and from an older recording. So I'm just going to put in uh, the item number. So if I just want something new, I can just place in here another variable and then it will uh, be, uh, be used in the next uh, in the rest of the scenarios. So this is the item number is coming from my filter that I was using when I was going on the um, released uh, products. Of course, if I change the parameter here and I want to use the new value in the next scenario, that's the reason why I put it also in an output variable. So I will have uh, the name actually will be passed to my next scenario via this output uh, variable. OK, that's for the first one. Let's look for the second one. So create my production order. I want to create my production order and I want to use the item number that was defined in my first scenario. So what I'm going to look for then is in my product table create. Um, I'm seeing here my item number. Is this, of course, still the value as uh, it was uh, when I started uh, uh, the recording? And now I'm going to uh, uh, change it with the output variable of my first recording. So if you remember, that was the name alias copy variable. So I'm just going to paste in, replace the value by the variable name. And I'm going to do that exactly the same for the name, which should be the same one, and just save it. From the create production order, I should have got uh, a uh, uh, production ID and I'm going to find that output variable name. So I see here that I have my production ID as output variable. And this is uh, my uh, <coughs> output variable for the quantity that I have been using for uh, my production order. So I need to remember those two parameters and I'm going to use that in my next recording. So the product ID I will need that at the moment that I'm doing. Um, I want to finish my uh, uh, <coughs> production order. So if I'm going to look into the third one, finish production order. Remember that that scenario started with uh, just going onto a filter on a production order. During the recording, I was using the value four four. Six, uh, I was uh, doing the demonstration when I did this recording, it was 442. And I'm going to overwrite it with the output parameter here. So I'm just going to copy that variable and replace the value by the variable name. And that's how I'm changing, uh, chaining my test cases to each other. Last step in this whole scenario is uh, looking into uh, the validation. And for the validation, 
I'm just uh, going to uh, uh, look into the last scenario, looking into And as you might remember, we do a filter. So, of course, I must make sure that I'm filtering on the right item. That's the chaining. Just going to copy that from the other one. All right. And then in the invent hand item, <coughs> invent on hand item path, I see now that I have uh, three columns. Typically, uh, if you just install uh, your regression suite out of, uh, <coughs> uh, without making any modifications, you would only have two columns. You would have the field name and you would have the value. And we would always doing the validation if it's equal to that value. If you want to have uh, an operator so that you could do uh, uh, Compa uh, comparisons like smaller than, smaller equal than, greater than, we need to make a modification to the setup file. And therefore, we're going to go into the configuration file. Configuration file, we will be finding that in the directory where we have been installing uh, our uh, regression suite automation tool. By default, that would be on my C drive. would be in the program files x86 would be under regression suite automation tool and then we will find here a config file if i'm just search for config files we will have a file which is called micro, uh, microsoft dynamics regression suite windows app.exe.config file that's the file where we need to make a modification and I need to find here some of the keys. And one of the keys is called add operator fields to Excel validation. By default, this will be on false. What you need to do is you need to change the value in true. And after that change, you need to restart your regression suite automation tool. And then next time you will be generating uh, the test execution and parameter files. That's the moment where you will get the possibility for getting the multiple operators. Basically, what uh, we're going to do here as operator, I'm going to make a formula now. And for the formula, I'm going to say it should basically be my variable, what was my on-hand physical before I started the scenario. And I need to add the uh, report as finished quantity. So this is my quantity schedule to it. So I'm just going to put a formula instead of a value here. And I'm just doing that by adding, by just important is that I'm not add additional things, but this is my physical invent variable. And I'm going to uh, uh, <clears throat> add my uh, uh, quantity scheduled to it. And that should be, that is my expected validation. If I'm saving that and all the other files, then I'm ready to run. So, now we have been uh, uh, having all the files, the preparation done. So typically the next step would be that I would be running my test suite. I would just be selecting here the all and I would be clicking on my run. I'm not going to start that. Uh, that would definitely take us for another uh, 10 minutes uh, for running it. But basically that's all what I have to do. Now, once that I have been verifying everything, uh, what I would be doing then is uh, basically uh, I'm going to safeguard all the changes that I have been doing to my Excel file. So I should not forget to upload the changes. And uh, if I have uploaded them, they will all be stored now in my Azure DevOps. And uh, the next time that I would be doing the load, I would basically getting the copies from which were stored in my Azure DevOps so that I don't have to redo all the modifications to the Excel files that I have been doing here now for the first time. And then after that, we can just execute it over and over. And that basically would then be the last step. The last step is that we would uh, uh, execute the test scenarios. And basically, um, we can be running that either uh, interactively, uh, could be done uh, via the graphical user interface, just by clicking the run. 
But of course, uh, uh, if we have to run that regularly, we typically would schedule that. So we could easily uh, use a scheduling uh, tool for just calling uh, the uh, playback of the suite. The reason why we can do that is because we do have a command line and we can actually run uh, everything from the command line. When would we be doing that? Well, uh, typically we would do it every time we get uh, we make big changes to the configuration. We're making changes to the data, or of course, if we get newer versions from the application, might be a newer version from Microsoft, might be a newer version from any of your ISVs, or it could of course also be one of your customizations that has been changed, and why of course we just want to verify that the modifications that we have been doing have not been introducing uh, blocking issues let's have a last word regarding the command line so the command line uh, for the command line i just need to run a command don't forget that we need to run it as an administrator so i'm just opening a command prompt i'm going to go to the place where I have been installing my uh, uh, regression suite automation tool, and then I can run there the console application. And I'm going just show you the question mark. So that will show me all uh, the commands that I have. So for instance, I could see a list would just give me a list of all uh, my test cases. I can ask the uh, test cases from a specific suite. So let's try that one. Just uh, uh, list test suite. And my test suite was called demo. And if I'm lucky, I am should get uh, my get on hand quantity. I will get my create production order. I will get my finished production order. I will do my validate on hand. And of course, if I'm running it from command line, typically uh, com the command that I would be using is doing the playback suite. Playback suite, and then give the name. And basically that would trigger the execution of first uh, scenario get on hand, second create production order, then finish production order, and then validate on hand quantity. Important to know is after that has been run, then we would validate the results. Of course, I would not be sitting in front of my screen watching uh, all those scenarios running. If I have to run that uh, regularly, uh, the outcome of a test suite will be uh, written into my uh, <coughs> Azure DevOps. So let's move to the Azure DevOps again. And I would find that under my test plan runs, just going to see all the ones that I have been running. Uh, going to select this one because that's one which was not complete correctly. So this is my demo where I had the four scenarios, but one has been failing. That was deliberately. Otherwise, I would have nothing to show here. So if I'm looking into my test results, I would then see which scenario has been failing. So it was my valid on hand quantity that was failing. And I could just click on this one and making sure that I uh, see what's going uh, wrong. And basically it says me uh, um, that at that moment my, uh, it failed. And typically it failed. Uh, I do remember why this was failing. Uh, I could also validate it by looking into the screenshot that was been taken. Just let's save that and then look up to it. I can see that it was taking the wrong number. So I have a screenshot of while it was failing, and that's the reason why it didn't work at that moment. But as you can see, you get uh, an error message, you get a stack trace, and you get information of why things uh, were failing. OK, I think I covered uh, everything that I uh, wanted to cover. Uh, I just uh, uh, want to hand over to Archana and see if there are some uh, questions that are uh, <clears throat> that we want to raise to the whole audience. Thanks, Mark. So there's a follow up question from yesterday's session. So there was a mention of a command line um, through command line command line script. Uh, we can also make sure the test execution is a part of the Azure DevOps build pipeline. 
So the question is, um, only through release pipeline, we deploy the package to tier two environment, but before deploying our code, how can we make it execute as part of build pipeline? Because if it, we can execute it only in my tier one build environment, which obviously will fail as I don't have admin access to tier one. So I don't know if you got the gist of the question. That's So I think essentially yeah. the ask is to, know, to be able to trigger yeah. our to build. So the, the, the answer to the question is what we need to do for being able to call it from uh, 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 the test uh, uh, from the build is that we would not run uh, uh, the R set on the build server, but we would still run the R set on uh, the test machine. And basically on the test machine, you need to install uh, the Azure uh, uh, build client and that would allow the build server to connect to the test machine and executing uh, the tests against uh, the um, the machine that you have been selecting. So uh, you could uh, easily there uh, just, uh, there is uh, in the command line, there is an option for having uh, the uh, settings files. So with uh, the use of the settings files, so with the slash settings and then here the settings file, I can just uh, make sure that my regression suite automation tool will be connecting to the right uh, environment. So this is one of the things we were discussing yesterday in the session about the setup. So I can have multiple settings files. So for each environment, I can have a different settings file. And then from the command line, I can force the regression suite, the console to use the right uh, machine. So that's how you would uh, integrate it into your build uh, strategy. Thanks, Mark. Um, is there a version control for the test in the future, or how is it thought that you have different versions of an RSAT test? That's a very good question. Um, uh, at this moment, uh, we would uh, uh, we don't have version control. It's on our wish list. I'm going to be very honest with it. Uh, of course, at this moment, uh, the top priority is making sure that whatever tests you are creating, uh, we are make we can be uh, doing a consistent replay. So bug fixing at this moment is the highest priority. Definitely in scenarios where we are. Uh, um, seeing that customers are depending on things that are not working. And then the next steps that we're working is we know that we do have limitations. What we can uh, replay is everything that can be uh, captured by the task recording. But that excludes, for instance, scenarios where you would be opening uh, a file, because if we're opening a file, we're using a part of uh, the operating system, the file control for selecting the file, and that will not be captured by task recording. Another one is uh, our mobile client applications. We do realize that a lot of our customers are using that. At this moment, uh, we, are, uh, we don't have it. It's coming uh, in the next in one of the next versions. And basically, if you want to use it, uh, it is available already in a preview. So if you are in the insider program, you could start uh, using that as well. And another one that is on our uh, pipeline uh, at the moment is uh, making sure that we would be able to capture also the scenarios which are coming from POS, um, MPOS or uh, CPOS, but at least we need to have uh, a way of capturing that information as well. So um, the wish list of having version control, yes, we do have it on uh, uh, our wish list, but it's not for near future. All right, um, so there are a couple of questions, two or three questions. I'm going to just bundle them together regarding negative scenario. Um, essentially, the ask is that, hey, can we have negative scenarios? And if they are negative and if they fail, which is expected and you're expecting the test case to pass. Like for one of the example is if I search for um, a certain value in quick search and if no records return, then the test case should fail. But in this case, because the task recording is, you know, you are searching for, a, let's say a product that does not exist. Um, it is a positive test case pass, but the expectation is they want the test case to fail. So kind of like a negative scenario. Yes, um, both uh, questions uh, uh, are on our wish list uh, and are uh, been worked on at the moment. 
So we want to make sure that you can validate that the list is empty. So you could see that something is not there. So that would be a validation. Then, um, so if you validate that something is uh, uh, negative and it should not be negative, uh, it will fail. The, the, the next one is that actually you would, uh, the fail of the test, you would like to see that as a positive. At this moment, we don't have it. Uh, it would be uh, just failing here, saying the result is uh, not okay. Uh, but uh, you would be expecting that, so uh, you would have to know uh, that it's an uh, uh, expected result. And we're also uh, having uh, a work item for seeing if we could have uh, somewhere a possibility that we could have an additional column that you could have a result, an expected result, and that the exact expected result would then be, uh, if you would have said that it should fail, that you could actually say this test has, uh, uh, was correct. But uh, at this moment, uh, no, uh, we, 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 we have it both as uh, on our to-do list. Thanks, Mark. Um, so there's also a request, but please show us the results of a test case that fails. Um, did you go through that? Sorry, I was not focusing on the demo. Yeah, you would just see here uh, the uh, error status. So the test fails, it will be uh, telling you what you have been trying to do, and it will identify why things were uh, not uh, working. There's a question then, on, oh, sorry. And then you have all the files, which were uh, telling me what kind of uh, uh, things have been happening, the steps and so on. So you could just save that uh, locally and then uh, looking into that. But you get a full um, lock of uh, any test case that uh, is failing. If you go to the ones where they're uh, uh, working correctly, you would, of course, have, don't have all those attachments. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to see. Oh, um, once R set runs all the test cases and the result is stored in DevOps test plans, can we send automated mails with the test results? I don't have insight into that, Mark, to you. I mean, this is more of a DevOps question. This is an Azure DevOps uh, question. Um, I know that you can have alerts in Azure DevOps, but uh, basically uh, uh, get, getting an alert uh, if something's happening, I, I, I have no yeah. uh, clue. I think, to, I think uh, we can follow up that on that. We are not aware of it. I'm sure there must be something in DevOps where you should be able to send automated emails, but we will need to follow up on that. Um, there is. You Sorry, need to ahead. know that uh, uh, if you schedule it to run, for instance, daily, um, then uh, every day you would have a, a result that you have to look into it. I do understand that probably you want only to get a mail if a test run was failing. Uh, that definitely will uh, already be quite complicated for setting that up, if at all possible. All right, uh, there's a question about, are there any plans to release pre-built test suites for RSAT? Um, I'll take that. So we do have conversations ongoing within the different product teams. Um, we do have pre-built test suites for the out-of-box functionalities that we are using internally for testing purposes. Um, and this has been raised as part of our RSAT workshops as, hey, is, does Microsoft have plans to kind of release that externally? So we do have conversations ongoing regarding that. We don't, we have not reached a conclusion, mostly because of the fact that even if we release our recordings, that's going to be against our demo data. So which means that you might be able to use that as reference, but there's still a considerable amount of work involved to edit all these Excel parameter files to update the data to suit that of your um, environments, your customers' environments or your own environments, which means we're not quite sure if we're adding value by releasing any of these pre-built test suites. Um, so, but but that is under consideration. We don't, we have not reached a conclusion yet on that, but you will definitely be hearing from us about it probably uh, the next half of this year. You need to uh, take into consideration that if you try, if you get a recording from us, which is built for uh, the demo database, uh, of course, you will be able to play it back in your demo database, but it doesn't mean it will be running into your uh, customer. Your setup might be different, as I was indicating already, depending on your setup, you might have other forms popping up. 
and uh, modifying recordings typically tends to be more complex than doing new recordings. I think the only value in it would be that you would get some examples from us more as a training material than it would to be uh, that it uh, would be able to be reused in your own scenarios. Thanks, Mark. Um, there is a question around, I believe, the WMS mobile app preview, which we had mentioned in our last tech talk. I just want to clarify that there is a, the preview feed, feedback program for our set support for WMS mobile app. It is not yet there. We are working on introducing a preview feedback program for that. Um, we don't have a clear ETA, but I, I'm hoping we should be able to get that um, introduced by next month. But right now, the preview feedback program is not there yet, but the plan is to get that introduced. We, we're just going through the formalities right now to get that as part of the Yammer feedback program. Um, is there any plan to extend the RSET for external systems integration testing? So the limitation of task recording is uh, uh, that you can only record the things that are happening within uh, the dynamics finance and operations. So uh, for integrations, uh, typically you, uh, if you were thinking about uh, incoming integrations that are coming from an external system, we don't have anything uh, in our roadmap for automating that. But of course, once you have been running the interfaces from externally, the validations that the data has been arriving correctly, that's something that you can do with RSAT. And since you can, uh, we do have the command line, so we could uh, um, make sure that our validations are run after an external system has been sending uh, that, if you have an external scheduler for doing that. So yes, uh, that's one of the things that, we, uh, that, that you can do today already. Um, regarding output uh, uh, messages that we're sending, we do realize uh, that, uh, of course, we want to make sure that every time you get exactly the same met message. So uh, your metadata should be the same as well as the data format uh, should be the same. And uh, we were uh, working on uh, something that uh, we would be able to validate that if you have uh, an uh, output package that uh, we can compare it with what was uh, what was generating before, what would be generating uh, now, and making sure that what is sent out is exactly the same. But that's something which is in the pipeline, and we don't have any ETA for that at the moment. I'm going to take a couple more questions, Mark, and then we should wrap up. Um, so this one is regarding there are there are two different variations of the same question. I'm going to put both across. Um, is it possible to run the same test case with different data groups? That means repeat the same test 20 times with different data in the same execution. There is also a variation of that is they want to run the multiple times the same set of test scenarios, but let's say with different items. You know, the items might have different, let's say, inventory model group or some of the characters associated with that. So one is generic, being able to repeat it with generic data. The other one is with specific data that chain that needs to be input but let's say specific different items, not a random item, but specific items. Yeah, so let's first talk a little bit about randomizing. That's indeed a topic that uh, we didn't uh, touch this time. It is in uh, one of the previous uh, tech talks. Um, you can use the Excel function. So I have been, uh, if I have create production order, I now have been using an output variable, but if I would just want to randomize it, I could just create here, um, that need to see create production order where I'm using the item ID. So this is where I have been using the input parameters. If I want to randomize, and uh, one of the things that I could do is, uh, probably this is not such a good example. Let's uh, try to see, um, uh, create a product mm, production order. One of the examples that we would be doing is we would, uh, I'm, just going to show you how you would be doing it is you can use the functions, the random functions in here and say for an item number, I'm going to use an Excel function. So I'm going to use uh, a concatenation of AT and then I'm going to, to use something which is always generating a new uh, item. So I would generate uh, now, I will be using now function 
and I'm going to use um, now. Okay, that's not really re readable. So I can just create a text out of that and then give it a format year, 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 um, MMM month, day, hour, minute, for instance. So that's what basically the technique that I'm using if I'm going to create new production orders. I need to be making sure that the production order, uh, that that item number doesn't exist. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to uh, use the function now in Excel. And every time that I'm opening the Excel file, I'm sure that I will get a new number. And that's basically what we're doing before we start running. We are reading the parameters from Excel. So we're opening the Excel and that will trigger a newly created number. Another function that you can use is ran between. So uh, then you would be uh, selecting a random number between uh, yeah, the, your start number and your end number. So that's how, how you can be randomizing into uh, uh, the regression suite automation tool itself. The next thing that you could be doing is uh, uh, using the command line. So uh, in our hands-on lab, uh, we have been, uh, uh, some examples where we are just uh, using PowerShell scripts for modifying uh, the field. So your PowerShell is just opening the Excel file, is uh, modifying the uh, field. So there you could just select from a list of uh, item numbers and just updating your Excel file. And then you run uh, your regression suite from the command line. And that's for instance, uh, uh, we, we do have an example there where we just uh, have been using create customer and we're just uh, changing every time uh, the customer ID, the street and uh, his address. And so you can randomly create uh, new uh, customers and you can do that in a uh, for loop, for instance, for creating 100 customers. That's it. Yes, it's all possible, but uh, you should not try to use this me methodology for doing large uh, data uploads. That is not suited for that. If you really want to do uh, upload of creating random data, then you need to look into the data migration framework and making sure that you have a file created, generated with uh, the, the data that you need to have and just uploading it via the data migration framework. I'm hoping that's answered the question. Thanks, Mark. Um, uh, we are literally 30 minutes past meeting time. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for attending the uh, Tech Talk. Janice, over to you. Thanks, Arjuna. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take a brief moment here and bring your attention to a link that I posted in the Q&A panel. That's a link to a short survey for this web conference. We ask that you please take a moment before logging out to access it. We hope that you found today's information helpful and if you enjoyed today's web conference, have feedback on how we can provide you with a better event or you'd like to submit topics for future web conferences.